Um, well, welcome. It is an honor to be here tonight to celebrate Australian animation. We have a very distinguished panel of guests who will be discussing all things Australian animation, uh, including its history, its contemporary status, and perhaps giving us some sort of indication as to where it might be headed in the future. In line with the title of tonight's event, 100 Things About Australian Animation, the panel will be discussing many, many different aspects of this topic. Um, but since we do have a fairly limited amount of time, we probably won't be able to cover all 100 things, nor comprehensively cover all 100 years of its history. Um, but it's certainly going to prove to be a interesting and informative evening. After the panel discussion, we will have a brief Q&A, um, so we'll be able to answer some questions. But I'd like to now firstly introduce the panel members, um, and then after that, I will invite Philip Adams to give uh, an oration. Um, firstly, though, I would like to introduce Philip Adams, who is a broadcaster, humanist, writer, and filmmaker. He is the presenter of ABC Radio National, Late Night Live. His films include The Adventures of Barry McKenzie, The Getting of Wisdom, Don's Party, Lonely Hearts, and We of the Never Never. And of course, <clears throat> he was producer on the feature animated films Grendel, 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 and Abracadabra, both of which were directed by Alex Stitt. As well as two orders of Australia, <clears throat> Philip was Australian Humanist of the Year in 1987, Republican of the Year in 2005, and received the Longford Award, which is the film industry's highest accolade. I'd also like to introduce Deborah Shapiro, who is an award-winning producer, curator, and academic. She's also a doctoral student and a lecturer in the School of Design, University of Technology uh, in Sydney. And her research interests include national cinemas of animation, indigenous animation, colonialism and animation, and Australian animation. And lastly, Malcolm Turner is the co-founder and director of the Melbourne International Animation Festival and co-director of the London International Animation Festival and the animation programmer for the New Zealand Film Festival and the Sydney Film Festival. And importantly, <clears throat> Malcolm is the 2014 Creative Fellow here at the State Library who has been researching the centenary of Australian animation. And I should also add that it is because of Malcolm that this whole event is actually happening tonight. It's him championing Australian animation that's really led to this event. Uh, so thank you, Malcolm. And also congratulations on the launch of the Journal of Australian Animation, which provides a much needed look into this subject. I would now like to invite Philip Adams to deliver the inaugural Alexander Stitt oration. I'm not terribly animated these days. It's a great, great honor to honor Alex whom I've regarded with nothing short of awe ever since first meeting him. Not that I recall exactly when that was. I have so many memories of this remarkable bloke that they crowd out and confuse each other, and I've lost the chronology. So I'm going to take one at random, and it should get things rolling. A young school teacher in Western Australia has written a song called Tie Me Kangaroo Down, which is enjoying a bit of a vogue, Yet I persuade him to sell me the rights for a few hundred quid to turn it into a jingle for a uh, now forgotten brand of bread. I commend the lyrics to you. They are worthy of Sondheim. It's got to be home pride bread, Fred. It's got to be home pride bread. It's the best you've ever been fed, Fred. It's got to be home pride bread. Wonderful. Alexander Stitt, young animator, takes those lyrical lyrics and animates the aforementioned Fred. He bases Home Pride's Fred on a mutual friend, a mutual Fred, Fred Skepsing. Thus, four careers converge, with Fred, Alex, and I yearning for careers beyond flogging groceries. I don't know what happened to Rolf Harris, but Fred, Alex, and I, in uh, various uh, pairings, would tackle a plethora of media and together and separately make a few films. Al, Fred and I were involved in television pretty much from its outset in 56. One of my first jobs was to make a 20-second TV ad for Mobile, an amateurish animation with Bruce Petty. 
and many other luminaries were working in advertising because there was really nowhere else to go. Australia can put in a plausible claim that we made the world's first feature film, but uh, a few decades of energetic production had long since ended, and truly Australian films were as few and far between as trees on the Nullarbor. In the entire decade of the 1960s, whilst awaiting David Williamson, four, just four Australian plays were professionally produced. We had notable novelists, including Xavier Herbert and the young Patrick White, but times were tough, which is why our best and brighter sent themselves to exile in England, the Humphreys, Beresfords, Hughes, Jameses and Greers. Anyone else of creative yearnings tried to get themselves a job in an ad agency. Now, these were eccentric organisations, not the multinational conglomerates depicted in Mad Men, so much as little shops often run, would you believe, by principals with close connections to the Communist Party. Principals who had, yes, abandoned their principles by becoming hucksters for capitalism. So if you wandered around an ad agency, you might bump into people like Fred and Bruce and Alex or Morris Lurie or Peter Carey, and Fred wasn't the only would-be feature director who was cutting his teeth on ads. Ray Lawrence, who'd collaborate with Carey on Bliss, was an ad director, and a great many of the cinematographers and editors who went on to shove Oscars in their tucker bags had served their apprenticeship in ads. I remember that one of my first jobs at a time when people were still watching television in shop windows was a cooking show with the first celebrity chef, Gene Baring, and I was paid five quid a week for the task and after each program would lead the dash to the flip stand and grab at the pre-cooked props. My most vivid memory is of grabbing a slice of cream cake, shoving it into my gob just ahead of the cameraman and floor manager, I need to discover the cream was Brill cream. 60 years later, I can still taste. I can still taste it, and I can still taste the bad taste that advertising left in our collective mouths. We wanted out. But until then, we were mercenaries, paid, overpaid to use skills with words and pictures to flog products of dubious merits or propositions with which we privately disagreed. Alex, for example, shocked me by making anti-labour ads for the DLP, the splinter group run by B.A. Santa Maria, inspiration to both Gerard Henderson and more recently Tony Abbott. To make matters worse, the ads were brilliant. Clearly Al didn't, Al didn't have his heart in them, and nor was he an ardent Christian when he made a legendary series of commercials for the Christian Television uh, Association in collaboration with the Presbyterian minister, Doug Tasker. Tasker. Alex created community service announcements over 20 years, ostensibly for Christianity, but covering poverty, migration, women's equality. Though an atheist, I uh, forgave him for those immediately and entirely, because um, of one simple reason. They were astonishingly clever images and metaphors that were they recycled today, would have Christopher Hitchens turning in his grave. And that's the trouble with Alex. Whatever he did, he did brilliantly. Now, I'm always awed by the skill of others. At the farm, I'm surrounded by people who, whilst barely literate, can fix the most complex Heath Robinsonian agricultural machines or string fences across the hills with wires so tight you can literally strum them or bow them as musical instruments. I look at the fingers of a, of a pianist or guitar player with bafflement. How can they move so fast? And I have the same envy for people adept on the keyboard of a computer. The great Arthur C. Clarke, whom I spoke to just before his death, had the view that any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Whatever you can do yourself, you take for granted, but what other people do that you can't do is enough to get me genuflecting. And that was and remains my response to Alex. He is a magician. I've long doubted that he is in fact a human. I used to joke that my oldest friend, Barry Jones, was sent to this planet in the last moment of Krypton's existence, along with his brother who became Clark Kent, while Barry became a quiz kid and all-round megabrain. 
Since then, it has dawned on me that we may well be dealing with triplets with Alex, another alien. Many of us felt deeply compromised by advertising and um, whilst waiting for the Whitlam era to release Australia's pent-up creative energies, and some of us cope by expiating guilt using our dark and arcane skills for worthier purposes. And again and again, Alex and I would collaborate, often with composer Peter Best, doing well-intentioned social engineering, the most famous example of which was Life Be In It. Uh, Al's character of Norm was almost an afterthought. He was the Alf Garnet of the campaign, and many of you will recall the name of Garnet from uh, Till Death Do Us Part. Alf was meant to embody all the negatives, all the of British bigotry, but became a cultural hero, as did Norm in Life Bunnett. And between Norm and the rest of the campaign, you had a social phenomenon. No one had ever thought of being funny with social engineering. So the TV stations, uh, after initial reluctance, were soon competing with, you, with each other to run more and more of the damn things. We couldn't make them fast enough. Awareness levels were over 90%. That's the highest figure ever recorded. And uh, in the world of new media, it will never be achieved again. We uh, also try to expiate our guilts and in other ways. I uh, worked as a double agent for the Anti-Cancer Council, headed by a wholly remarkable strategist that recently deceased uh, Nigel Gray. And Alan and I collaborated on another campaign for Nigel, aimed at melanomas, but instead of didactic finger-shaking messages, the sort of uh, things you see on cigarette packs currently, we borrowed uh, a semblance of Sylvester the cat, famous for his interactions with Tweety Pie, I taught us a putty tat while Peter Best turned the slogan slip, slap, slop into a syllabant jingle. It's uh, now been on air for about 30 years, which is a few years more than uh, Louis Mortine's uh, endlessly murdered, but all but apparently a mortal fly. The three of us would collaborate again for the International Year of the Child with Peter's Care for Kids song and Alex's moving images moving in more ways than one. Al was Australia's Milton Glaser. Glaser, an extraordinary designer, uh, best known for giving the world, uh, or at least the US, the I Love New York logo, the letter I, the heart shape, followed by NY, all on the same line. And in the same way, I love AS, though my feelings were often tinged with something between envy and resentment. I accepted the fact that Al was a genius at graphics, that every move of a pencil and paintbrush would produce wit and elegance. But why did he have to be so damn good at words? I regarded them as my province. But Alex used them with such imagination and originality, not that he was alone in this regard. Many of our best graphic artists, certainly most of our great cartoonists, are as good with words as with pictures. Bruce Petty writes so vividly, of course, as does his direct creative descendant, Mike Lunig. Cartooning and writing clearly can be seen as variations of the same phenomena. And international examples abound with the likes of Jules Fiverr or Gary Trudeau. But none of them can do what Alex would and could do down the track. And that is write prose and poetry and lyrics for songs that would not have embarrassed uh, Sondheim or Coward or Porter. And I commend to you one of the films we would make years later, Abracadabra, where, where in Alex's songs, sung by young Johnny Farnham, are marvellous, not simply in their cleverness, but their wisdom. I was one of many drawn to Alex, right through the 60s and the 70s, his magic provided the flame for many a moth, and we're talking some pretty impressive moths, more than capable of their own butterflies of fancy. Uh, I played a modest role in Australia's uh, first animated film for grown-ups, Grendel, 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 the first feature that Alex wrote and directed, a real animated film, hand-drawn, hand-painted, the way they used to be, and I still treasure many of the original cells, and they're stuck up all over the, all over the place. 
It was, I suspect, years if not decades ahead of its time. But Al's poignant account of the Beowulf legend, a spellbinding blend of words and images, gives it a secure place in the history of animation. Yet if you Google or Wikipedia the topic of animation and its history, Australia doesn't seem to make the cut, but it will soon as a result of your extraordinary efforts. And I congratulate you for them and the State Library for helping out. Uh, a few years later, Stitt the Magician appropriately made Abracadabra the first animated feature in 3D, employing a technology invented by two other friends from the old days, our old days in advertising, Mike Browning and Volk Moll, once again years, if not decades, ahead of its time. I've known Alex for much of my life. The same applies to Patty, his missus. This has been a marvellous marriage, and yes, collaboration. And Patty and I share the conviction that her husband and my friend deserves to be recognised, applauded, appreciated, awarded. And may we be joined in this by so many people that Alex educated and inspired. Now, thanks to all the new technologies, animation is an immense industry, culturally dominant. But uh, in the case of the major films, it is no longer or very rarely the art form of what used to be or the province or what used to be an auteur, an individual who was overwhelmingly responsible for every aspect of a film. Now a major animated feature has enough credits for the phone directory as scores of writers and designers and technicians collaborate on a Pixar or Disney epic. But Alex made his films by hand and mind. Even if the thing wasn't worth doing, like an ad for home pride bread or the DLP, Alex did it well. Alexander, as I said a few moments ago at the beginning, it is an honour to honour you. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Stitt, who will now stand up for us. Perhaps another round of applause for both. <laughs> All right, well, as has been said, this is 2015, which marks the centen centenary of when Harry Julia signed a contract with Australia Asian film, Films to produce the weekly animated series Cartoons of the Moment which really was the first animated series to be produced in Australia. Now, throughout the past 100 years, Australia has produced a vast amount of animation. Um, short films, television series, adverts, specials, and feature animated films. And if you add it all up, it equates to literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of animation that was produced locally. Unfortunately, as most of us know, um, quite a few of these animations have gone quite uncelebrated. And it's something that a number of us have been working on, um, trying to rectify this through our research, involvement, and promotion of these works. So, um, and with Malcolm's journal, hopefully this will really continue. Um, perhaps as a way of introducing our panelists here, um, each of you perhaps could tell us how you first got involved in animation, particularly Australian animation. Um, Deb, would you like to start? Um, I actually got involved because of Louis the Fly. Um, so it was interesting that you mentioned that, Philip. Uh, I was at uni, I'd done art, realised I couldn't make money out of it, so did a design degree. And these, uh, it was just when, my age will show, it was just when Apple was starting to make particular computers. And I really liked them. So the head of the computing department in my university said, you know, you're so fast at it, I'm going to exempt you from classes. I'm just going to take you on this road, take you to Zap. I'm going to do something for you. So after a day in a cold, dark room, uh, making wireframe animation with a lot of blokes, no offence, guys, um, I found myself going, oh, my God, is this my future? 
And then I walked upstairs and there was a traditional animation studio and there was light coming in the room and back in the day where people did smoke and there was wood on the floor and people were making Louis the Fly do rude things. And I thought, this is for me. You know, it sort of combined graphics and all the rest of it and it was really great. But there were no, um, there weren't any university courses. You know, it's interesting, I work at university now and we try to teach everybody everything. Our lecturers really didn't teach us anything, but in a way they taught us everything because we just went out and made it ourselves. And so a fellow student and I, Andrew Horn, and I optioned an Olga Masters story. And I think really it was Olga, the strength of Olga's story, which was fantastic. And we animated it, but um, we kind of did it not knowing how to animate. So we had stop motion characters that were this big. It was only when I met Nick Park, etc., at Annecy that I realised you could actually work with characters this big. You know, So really it was a DIY aesthetic and it was wonderful because it, it was an adventure. People have been wanting to create the illusion of motion in static figures for thousands of years. I um, managed to get into the Altamira Caves shortly before they were closed to the public and marvelled at these paleolithic drawings of animals, which were, first of all, in 3D, because the artist who painted them rather wittily would use a protruding curve of rock to paint the bum of a bison. And you could understand, you could imagine the way those drawings would have moved as they moved around the caves themselves, waving their, their torches around, their, their burning torches. It's an impulse that has been a part of human interest or human aspiration for thousands of years with all sorts of mad little devices to, uh, for you to look at with sp spinning disks and, uh, and refracting mirrors. For me, I became interested in animation when I was bored shitless at Eltham High and I'd draw little stick figures, you know, on the, or on the, on the corner of a, of a textbook and just riffle through them and was thrilled at my own ingenuity in getting an illusion, of, an illusion of motion. So imagine my happiness when later in life I stumbled into a, a working relationship with Alex. And uh, I think that's my story in its essence. Um, mine, I can't draw, I can't do any of those things. For me it was um, a failed theatre director. I emerged from university with a freshly minted BA in theatre directing, um, harbouring delusions of adequacy, I suppose, that I might go forth and direct a few players, which I did to varying levels of, of review. Um, but I, I was, there were a number of theatre directors going a number of different directions, and the direction that I wanted to go in was I wanted to explore more extreme and more interesting and more abstract ideas and doing that in a theatre setting, a theatrical setting where you are up against the laws of physics and up against the laws of gravity and, and all the rest of it and, and I, I can trace my epiphany moment, I mean I grew up with anime, I grew up with Bugs Bunny and things but, but my interest in, in creative animation was sparked on one particular day when I was actually taking a class and we were talking, we were having a conversation about the difficulties of taking your cast, your audience, your story and even your physical set from one place to one very, very different place very quickly within the confines of what you have in a theatre. And one of the students simply said, you know, basically you're in the wrong game, mate, and showed me a, a VHS tape of a film called Mindscape by Jacques Duran, which is uh, it's online, you can see it, it's made on a pin screen, three quarters of a million pins jammed into a frame about that big, and it is nothing but this kind of Im Im immaculately created series of morphs from one space to one very different space to a different space. It just keeps going for six or seven minutes. So it took him about seven years to make. And immediately I saw that, I knew exactly that that's what I was, that's the art form that I was looking for. I'd just been looking for it in the wrong building. I saw out my contract there, went back to New Zealand where I originally come from, told the film festival there a whole lot of lies and got a job as the animation programmer and um, started looking around the world for a place that would want an animation festival that I would like to live in that might support it and 
hear him. Thanks. Since we're talking about Australian animation, um, perhaps it might be a good idea to try to define or express what Australian animation is. Um, and it might be something that's impossible to do. But if you look at the history of animation productions, particularly some of the larger ones like um, Marco Polo Jr., which is regarded as the first Australian animated feature, um, it was actually a co-production with an American studio. And all of the pre-production work, or most of the pre-production work, was done overseas. But all of the animation was done here. Um, and then more recently, uh, there's a film like uh, uh, the Magic Pudding from 2000, um, where all of the pre-production work was done here, and it's you know very much a classic Australian story, but all of the animation was done overseas. And so when you get these international collaborations, it perhaps becomes a bit difficult to define, but perhaps there's other ways of defining it too in terms of content. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I'll take that one first, if you like. I think um, one of the best ways to understand Australian animation is to actually look at the short films and not so much at the feature films. Um, I, that said, um, a good number of the short films are have a very international or very hard to define, it's very hard to kind of pin down what culture they may have been made within, but nonetheless there are, if I had to put numbers to it, the, 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 the Australianness of animation I think is probably largely kind of presented through the short films, you know, some of the films that Sarah Watt did and you know, even some of the, the series like Dust Echoes a few years ago. Um, I, I'm constantly asked when I'm overseas, you know, what, what, what's Australia like and what are Australians like and all the rest of it. And a lot of our films don't use a lot of the qualities that I think are unique to Australia and I appreciate um, the sensitivities about um, taking over, you know, elements of indigenous culture and, and hijacking that and incorporating that into works. But nonetheless, there are ways and means, but there are also, you know, our scenery, uh, you know, our particular light, our colours, our vivid um, kind of landscapes and things like that don't turn up as often as you might think, but I, I would say the short films. But it's interesting you say that because um, with Yoram's passing recently, it's interesting because I used to have a little um, post-it note up in my studio say, saying marsupial free zone. Um, but there is something that I felt that Yoram did with the landscape, which is that um, he was an outsider and he was mm. able to actually look at Australia in a very different way. And often it takes an outsider to show you yourself. And um, whilst his films aren't the kind of films that I wanted to make, I think that he actually used, you know, he was one of the first people that used the Australian landscape in Australian animation and Australian film, um, animals, etc. cetera. Um, and I think there's something about that that really is quite fantastic. You know, it, it was something that was really quite amazing. Um, but in the independent circuit, I think that in the 19, you know, it, it follows that colonial path where we were outsourcing for a long time and emulating other countries for a long time and, and I think people like Alex, um, you, you may not have felt brave at the time but it's an incredibly brave thing to take on a feature full stop but also to take on an independent feature as well and independent film in general in the short films in the 1980s I think that there was this amazing, amazing um, surge in finding our own voice and that was due to Whitlam in the 70s, it was due to Philip here fighting for an Australian film industry and where we were finally able to say perhaps we don't need a mother or father, perhaps we could actually stand up on our own. I think that's changing. I think we're actually trying to emulate other people a lot um, again. Um, but I think there's still a, a lot of strength and voice in our independent animation. I mentioned uh, Australia's claim to have made the first feature film. It was a two-reeler on Ned Kelly. And it sets up a saga, a story of bifurcation that ran forever after. That is while someone was making a film of an Australian bushranger in that paddock. Over there, someone was doing an American Western here in Australia. And those two threads, the national film versus the, the attempts to make an international film, are still major cultural and sometimes political divisions. I, um, the page that I wrote for Gorton 
which got the whole thing going again, said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That was a sort of an in-joke, borrowing one of the most famous phrases in American history. It is time to see our own landscape, hear our own voices, and dream our own dreams. Gorton bought it, and that was the assumption on which the revived Australian film industry was based. That no longer has much meaning or relevance. Australian films in the AFI awards, I think they're called something else these days, can in fact uh, be a film like The Great Gatsby, which uh, to me had, doesn't have an awful lot to say about Australia. So the definition of my simple rugged definition that we had a duty and a job to tell our own stories in our own voices to our own people primarily uh, is now blown out of the water and there's such a there are so many idioms so many voices so many blurrings of definition that i have uh, long since surrendered and acquiesced but i do so sadly because i i still prefer to see films made in australia animated short, long, whatever, that do have some sort of commitment to, a, to what's left of a, an identifiable culture. And we're very different from the United States. We don't really, we have Tony Abbott's, we have yet to have a Donald Trump. We, uh, it is, abortion clinics are not bombed in Australia. We don't send thousands of thousands of people off to prison the way the United States do, and we've long since given up capital punishment. In other words, we have much to culturally and politically celebrate, and that, I think, is the first job of any artist, no matter what idiom or medium they're using. Can I just say something on that? Because um, if you get to read this magazine, uh, this journal, which I think Mel's just been a hero doing this, um, my article in it is about a fantastic experience I had recently at the 17th National uh, Remote Indigenous Media Awards. And it made me remember why I became a filmmaker. And Indigenous filmmakers uh, are using live action and animation to keep their culture alive. And it was that, that same excitement I had of being allowed to, I, I feel very privileged, I feel a generation that was allowed to have their own voice and to explore their own voice. And I, th I feel that my, um, not all of my students, but some of my students at the moment feel they just need to have an international voice. And when I was at the um, Remote Indigenous Media Awards, there was that same excitement. Here were people wanting to reflect their own culture and the energy and the excitement around that and the quality of the films and, and the amazing work that was being done really rev it made me feel so energised again about filmmaking. And I think um, what's happening at the moment is actually that our Indigenous culture is, th is are the filmmakers, you know, Indigenous filmmakers are the filmmakers that are not internationalising themselves, that are saying, this is Australia. And I think that's an interesting equation. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to s just see things that I recognise from first-hand real-life experience depicted in a film. For all of that, though, I mean, sometimes cultures travel in ways that you can't quite predict. I was at a, a screening in Los Angeles, um, the world the world animation celebration, God bless the Americans. It was 90% American films and 10% everybody else. But there was one Australian film, a film called Bad Baby Amy. I'm not sure if you remember, but it was produced by SBS. I think Tony Lawrence, it might be Anthony Lucas, directed it. Brief synopsis is, a, a, a widowed farmer and his daughter and an Aboriginal stockman living alone on a farm that is uh, been suffering drought forever. The banks are about to take it over. If the rains don't arrive now, that will be the last stroke. And Aborig the Aboriginal stockman finds a crack in the terrain, finds a special stone, throws it down there, the water erupts, there's rains, the farm is saved. The film ends with all three of those characters, the the landowner, the daughter, and the Aboriginal stockman standing on the veranda with their arms around each other, celebrating the falling rain across this beautiful terrain, and the, the farmer saying, thank goodness for blackfella, magic, for blackfella magic. And it was one of the few times that I've seen members of an audience rise up and shout at a TV screen. And, you know, when I left the cinema, the, the festival director was being assailed by a few people. And, of course, what those people heard 
was not, you know, the language that we understand. They heard the N-word. That was all they heard. And they thought it was nothing but a racial slur of the worst kind. And, you know, sometimes things just don't translate as, as well as you would hope that they would translate into different, you know, cultural settings. And then, you know, trying to translate Estonian animation into any setting is another challenge altogether. Um, perhaps each of the panellists could tell us one particular Australian film or animator or even a moment in the history of Australian animation that um, has really stood out for you, that, that you really latched onto. Um, Philip, would you like to begin? No. <laughs> I've already instanced okay, a few in um, my work with Alex. I would say there's a few. I think Bruce Petty, uh, one, I think he's the most amazing man. Um, and I feel very privileged to have worked with him as well. But I think um, Leisure was fantastic because I think that, you know, just understanding animation could be something outside of... Um, a purely commercial means and that, that an Australian animator could actually win an Oscar and I feel the Oscar should have gone to Bruce, I'll be controversial here um, I, I have very strong feelings that that Oscar should have been put in Bruce's hands um, and then I think there's a whole, you know, there's a whole trajectory, I think the, the 1980s and 90s was um, a kind of golden era a real, because funding agencies began to actually support film um, in a very, very, very decent way. And you, you started to get people coming back to Australia. You started to get a lot of people like Dennis Tapakoff, who I think is an amazing animator, Lee Whitmore, the late and great Sarah Watt. Um, we all used to get together and it was, it was an amazing time of um, ideas, competition, voices that were actually allowed to be personal and not international. And then things like, um, you know, Adam and um, Anthony, again, going for Oscars, things like that, I think, were really quite meaningful. Um, again, I, I would also say, Alex, I have a... Um uh, just a love particularly for Grendel, 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 the, the feature film. I think if you get a chance to um, see it, there is... I, I could go into a, a breakdown of why that film is a work of genius, but just if you get a chance to see it, I would say you've got an opportunity to see a completely unique film, beautifully designed, wonderfully animated, you name it. I think... Um, I think for me one of the, the moments is a more recent one than some of the ones you guys are talking about. Um, in 2000 and one or two, um, SBS uh, stepped up and, and funded adequately, more than adequately, a, a, a series of films called Home Movies. And they made, I think there were six, perhaps eight, and they were all superb. And they, 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 together they showed what the, the cream of um, Australian animation talent at that time were capable of. It was a beautiful showcase and it's one I've been reviewing, I've been going through some of the leftover footage and some of the interviews and things for, for home movies and I, you know, next year I think is the 15 years since home movie and is it something I'm going to explore um, at the next animation festival but that's, you know, and you can, st you can see that, that, that stuff's online. Dad's Clock by Dick Jarman I think is a beautiful film. Stands the test Did of you time. see Swimming Outside the Flags? That actually yeah, came yeah, from yeah. an initiative called Swimming Outside the Flags where I went to um, SBS and the AFC and we got 19 animators. And it, it, that stemmed from going over to Annecy, the Annecy International Animation Festival and realising that there were nationalities of cinema that were supported in animation. And I always knew live action had nationalities that were supported and obviously I liked nationalities of animation, but seeing countries support their animation in a way where they would have stands where it would be packaged. I mm. um, actually approached the AFC and SBS to do Swimming Outside the Flags and Home Movies was the next one after that. Yeah, so there's, yeah. there's actually 25 films in that yeah. whole period. Yeah, that was a great series too. Yeah. Um, well certainly Grendel, Grendel, Grendel stands out as being a, a great, amazing film. Um, Philip, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what drew you to that project and, and your initial involvement in it. Well, Alex uh, discovered that a new version of Grendel, 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 of Grendel, 
had been written by an American novelist. Al, a prompt, please. John Gardner, now sadly deceased. And uh, it was a sort of an anti-hero version. It was subtle and, and poignant, and uh, it seemed an audacious idea to even approach, to approach him for the rights, but we uh, managed to inveigle them. And Alex thought we could make an animated film for grown-ups. Now, look, this is terribly important. The tragedy of animation is that it's always been equated with being funny. One of the first animated films in history was called The Idea, and it was based on the woodcuts of Honegger. And The Idea is the idea of artistic creation, and it's a little film, an animated film, about censorship. So you have a little naked figure who is subject to every form of abuse by officialdom and authority. And, all, and ever since I saw that, I'd always realised that animation could be an incredibly serious way of communicating ideas. Al and I had always found in our work together and our separate works that a, a little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. I've always found that you know, putting serious ideas in just a, a tiny bit of the honey of humour helps. And that's what Al did with Grendel. It's about big, dark, cosmic ideas, but it's rendered light and deft through, um, through animation. And in a way, animation can become a trick. It can become a way that audiences are drawn in to subject material that they wouldn't contemplate seeing as a, in live action. And I think that's happened to some extent now. Not all the, the great animated features are entirely brainless. Many of them I find uh, very impressive, whether they're tackling you know, climate change or any other serious topic. So, but Al was the pioneer of doing it here, of saying that let's make a, an animation film that wouldn't be totally irrelevant to children, but its audience, its target audience, are their parents. Now, it didn't work. The film is marvellous, but we never really found a consequential audience for it. Perhaps that was um, my fault as much as anything, but I do think that people were not then prepared to think about important subjects within an animated uh, frame. It can still be hard, I know, um, because I come from filmmaking, but I ended up working as a creative producer, and um, I think, you know, I love children's animation, but it's not where I wanted to work. And trying to jump out of the kiddie's playpen uh, has always been really, really hard. And I think that that ability of animation to deal with hard content, to actually be able to, to let an audience distance itself enough so it's not threatened, that it, it gets pulled in, is, is something that's quite amazing. Right. And in a way, you did that with your productions or your producing role of the Lunig short films, um, which were, you know, very brilliant, poetic, contemplative pieces. Um, how, how, what was your experience in, in producing those? Um, it was interesting because uh, Brian um, came to us and kind of went, "Want to animate Lunig?" Um, and they, well, I, I could actually do a better impersonation of him than that. Um, he was wonderful to work with, by the way. Um, but he wanted to do it exactly the way that Lunig's work was uh, on the page. Because, you know, I grew up with Lunig as a hero, and it is very difficult to work with things like that. But I'm not, Andrew and I weren't interested in just slavishly replicating what was on the page. I don't think there's any point to doing that when you are taking it into another medium or when you're working creatively. And I think because we'd grown up with Lunig, we understood him and we wanted his world to exist. So that's why we took it into stop motion. And an interesting thing about Lunig was that we couldn't work with anybody that didn't understand his work. So we had some people working on the production that had no idea about Lunig, hadn't grown up with him. And it was, we really had to educate them. 
And so in the end, most of the crew had grown up with Lunig or knew Lunig or whatever, and, and, and there was that way of kind of bring it in, bringing it in, making it, it come to life. But I think working with Bruce was even more so like that. I think Bruce's mind is one of Australia's finest minds around animation and thought. And his brain is connected to his pen, completely and utterly connected to his pen. Uh, Film Australia said, find a way to work with other animators with Bruce's work. I thought, and I spent six weeks, three months or something with Bruce and came back to them and said, there's no way. His brain is connected to the pen, but just let us do it. And they did, which was fantastic. I'm interested in um, discussing perhaps a bit about the current state of, of animation and from that perhaps where it might be headed. Malcolm, do you have any thoughts? It's fracturing, diversifying, whatever phrase you want to use it. In my particular field, my, my passion is to support and show the work of auteurs, of artists, of people that um, make a film because they have some compelling expression that they want to make. Um, as often as not in Australia, that's done within a, a tertiary or a school field, but nonetheless, these are very personal films. So the phrase animation is a little bit like the phrase writing. You know, I'm a writer. What do you write? Do you write romance novels? Do you write journal essays? I mean, there's a very large swathe of things. I mean, there's, there's now so many different types of animation. I don't think anybody is across all of them. I, uh, from my perspective, though, of working within what I regard as an artistic community or a community of, of, of artists creating artworks, uh, all the challenges that artists have always faced are still there. The issues of funding are still there. The issues of um, trying to find an audience are still there. The um, plethora of technologies that have been unleashed to make animation has been a double-edged sword. The people that have mastered those technologies are now off doing really fantastic things with them, leaving behind the people that just thought it was kind of pretty cool to turn on a computer and turn a red circle into a blue square or something like that. But it would probably surprise a lot of people to know in many ways how few films um, that at least come from that, that community rely entirely on com computers to make them. I mean, people that make short animated films uh, are generally people that have a need to visually express something, and some of those percentage of them express that using computers at all, but many of them still use sand, many of them still draw, some of them still draw onto a, a, a tablet or something, but you'd be surprised how many are still drawing on paper, many of them are still operating puppets and pieces of plasticine and things like that. We're getting films that are made with coffee grinds and people are coming up with gelled water. I saw one film that was made out of water that had been semi-frozen and manipulated that way. There are an incredible number of techniques and those, whether there will remain an audience for that, I don't know, but there will always remain people that simply want to draw, that simply want to put their hands on some sort of physical material and get a result out of that, and a percentage of those people want to see their images move, and those people are animators in my world, and, and that's as strong as it's always been. I wholeheartedly agree. Simple as that. Okay. Okay. Um, I will agree with that as well. Um, I'll add a little bit, which is I think that animation is now part of all digital culture, and one of the hardest things about being an independent animator is making money. Okay, so there's more opportunities in some ways, although a lot of people want people to work for nothing. Um, but there are lots, there are opportunities in quite, in quite a diverse range of, um, or, or d diverse formats like projection mapping, all the rest of it. The hard thing I think at the moment is this crazy work, this kind of neoliberal kind of work thing. Um, and also the fact that, that globalism and, and this, um, this phrase about the market is, is really difficult. So what I find looking at my students, because I've, I'm really privileged now, I, I do feel very privileged working in a university. I think we are the development arm of the industry now. There is very little development money around in Sydney Metro Screen and is closing on November 11th, which I think is, I still can't believe it. Um, Screen Australia gives very little money to animation, I think it's, you know, and it's always been a hard ask, but there's even less 
now, um, and they're all going genre, genre, formula, formula, formula. Um, so universities are kind of the development arm. And the thing that I'm noticing is that there's a lot of amazing, I'm, I'm going to be polarising here, there's lots of great men animating, but it's really interesting. I did a, um, a curation for Tricky Women at the beginning of the year, and I was so proud of Australian women animators because they were speaking with their own voice a lot more than... There were a lot more women... I'm not saying men don't speak with their own voice, but there are some fantastic men speaking with their own voice, but um, there, there seemed to be a lot more women speaking with their own voice than there were men, and there's this... There, because there is a tendency to want to fall into the popular, which is imitating Pixar or whatever, or, and being international, whatever, but... I do think, I, I'm still seeing that next generation come through, which I think is quite fantastic. I'd like to make one point about animation, which I should have incorporated in what I said about Alex, which has to be said. Not so long ago, animation was the province of a, fi of a form of filmmaking where you could do the, you could do things that you could imagine that couldn't be done. There was no way of doing them in live action because special effects were, were primitive and crude. So animation was freewheeling. It allowed you to create any sort of world or fantasy and it was the only way to do it. Then, all of a sudden, everything changed with, with digital live action. And now it's hard to work out what's animated and what's real. I, I can't do it anymore. I go to the movies and I'm trying to work out, is that solid and real? Is that something that is, they've actually photographed? Or is it a bit of digital conjuring? So now you've got both live action capable of doing anything, but animation has responded to that, not by giving up, but by, in some ways, scaling down. Mm. And that's the interesting thing, that there are so many young auteurs who are like Stitt, mm. They do it all themselves. Yeah. And there are, and that's, that's, I would say, the majority, or perhaps not all themselves, but the majority of themselves, and that's certainly the majority of the people that would submit films to, say, the Melbourne International Animation Festival. To put that in perspective, last year I got just under 3,500 submissions from um, independent filmmakers from all over the world, from probably 45, 50 countries. And... Um, you know how many animated feature films were released last year? Three, four dozen. Um, you know there is a tremendous amount of this sort of stuff being made still, and it's very, very different, and it's made for very different reasons than um, the kind of animation that tends to take up most of the oxygen in the public space. The one point that I would add, because you probably want to get onto Q and A or something, I'm not sure, but but where, ten, fifteen years ago, I'd walk into a classroom university classroom and I would say who wants to be a filmmaker and 80, 90 percent of the, the kids would put up their hands, you know, how many of them would go on and do that, I'm not too sure. Nowadays I don't even ask that question, I kind of quit asking that when the numbers got down to about kind of 15 percent and and I think the, the somewhere along the line we lost the pure passion to simply educate our kids and, and turn education into some sort of export industry or some sort of, you know, money generating machine I think and with that has come um, uh, a need to walk away from that particular experience with a specific set of skills with which you can pay back the debt that you've accumulated and you're unlikely to be able to pay much of that debt back by sitting in your lonely garret flicking out, you know, one five minute sand animated film every five years, you're probably you know, looking for a job at Pixar, you know, where you animate a hand or your specialty is the texture on top of clouds or something like that and that's, a lot of people are studying that. But it's also because the value system at the moment around funding is bums on seat and it's not culture. Mm. And um, I think that's, just getting back to the Indigenous animation, the thing that I found amazing is that it, animation is being used as a tool of cultural resilience. And it's, it, when you start to see the way that animation is being used to keep, to keep culture alive, to keep language alive. So most of these animations are done in um, Indigenous languages in the hope that um, it does keep language alive. It, and, and, it, and it is. Um, but also so that there is a reflection of um, Indigenous people on the screen as well. And the thing about animation is that 
you've got technology which makes it easier, but you also um, have handmade techniques. And the thing that's beautiful at the moment is I think that we've gone past that digital divide where I would say you can tell anyone over 40 because they think that anything digital is either God or the devil. And most people under 40 are just happy to use whatever works. And I find that with my students as well. Um, and it's interesting looking at Indigenous animation too because, you know, it's either hands-on or digital, whatever it takes, whatever works for what you want to do at the moment is what people will use. And I think that it's a really refreshing attitude. The, f the film that officially opened the international competition programs in MIAF last year was made entirely out of about 10, 11,000 pieces of cardboard cut out um, and and you know put on you know handmade landscapes and shot and they used so much of a particular grey it was made in Slovakia and they used so much of a particular grey tone of cardboard they exhausted the entire supply of that particular colour in the entire country but entirely handmade and except for the credits entirely handmade two people with knives and scissors it took them a couple of years because no one wants to sit in front of a computer for the rest of their lives no. <laughs> All right. Um, just looking at the time, I think we might open it up for a little bit of questions and answers from the audience, if anyone would like to ask any questions. Yes? Which one should develop? Oh, thanks. With the, like, the development of uh, Netflix comes with like, more accessible animation and therefore like, a larger demographic. Do you reckon there's room for Australian animation to uh, delve more into adult um, type animations, some that may reflect philosophical ideas or uh, historical like events and such? Anyone would like to tackle that? Or? I, I, actually, if I could, Philip, do you think if Grendel Grendel was, was made today that it would be much more successful? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Anyone else want to respond to it? When the pay TV stations um, started, because of niche marketing, we were finally able to work on adult themes with animation. You know, it used to be terrible saying that um, you did adult animation because people thought you did pornography. Um, but there still is a, a schism. There really is a schism. Because even if you look at things like um, Princess Mononoke, which is a fantastic film. Um, what happened when it released in the States was that it was very difficult for people to wrap their mind around the fact that it might be for adults because um, Americans gave it a, I think it was like a 15 plus, which is quite crazy considering what you see on, in American films. Um, and so it bombed at the bomb, it completely bombed at the box office. So it's no surprise that, that uh, Miyazaki's next film was actually much more child friendly after that. And it's very difficult to finance um, animation without having those kind of worldwide sales. But I would say that when you, there is much more of a market now, um, you can have different forms of distribution, but what it takes is being brave. Um, I think Alex was very brave. I think you just have to be brave, and if you do it, and, you, and you, you also learn the business side of things, and this is something people don't do enough, you, you can learn the business side of things without selling out. And it's really important to know art business. So if you want to make an, a fantastic adult feature film, learn some art business. And I got dragged kicking and screaming to art business. I, I just, I didn't want to do it, but now I'm really thankful that I learned about art business. And I think more people need to combine what they want to do with learning about art business. And it's not just about selling out to bums on seats, it's actually learning how to work the system. Oh, yeah, I don't really, I'm not utterly qualified for that, but I, I would say this now, nowadays, I mean, there always has been, but nowadays, there are so many moving parts to making um, a feature film and most of those moving parts have got next to nothing to do with whether the film's any good or, you know, the creatives involved in it. It's, it's uh, yeah, hard to get it out there. Hi, my name's Sarah. Um, I was just wondering, would you say that um, independent animation sits in a kind of awkward spot between art and entertainment? 
And where do you think the boundaries sort of are? I know the blurry ones. Independent animation sits somewhere between art and and what was it? And, and entertainment. Yes, it does, because the confusion still exists about what are the parameters of animation. There is a, a, a pre. It is animation is perceived, I think, incorrectly in terms mm. of its uh, if its function, and that. Uh, is gradually, I suppose, easing away. Look, I also want to make the point that, uh, I want to go back to, uh, to Alex's film. The reason that, uh, that it was so interesting thematically was that Gardner and Stitt decided that the monster was, in effect, in effect a vulnerable, lovable, decent character, where monsters had always been uh, you know, monstrous. Although I must admit, even in the even in the early Frankenstein films, you know, you, there's that there's the poignancy about uh, about Boris Karloff, and I think that uh, in moving films from category to category, it takes time and it takes money, and that's something we never had. The American film would arrive in Australia, whatever its category, pre-promoted with the best release dates provided by Hoyts and Greater Union. You know, the, the odds were stacked against mm. Australian films of any category, and they're still certainly stacked against uh, animation. I am ashamed to say that in all the funding bodies I was involved in setting up, whilst we always tried to, uh, to put money directly into um, in, into documentary as well as feature, we never really thought of animation as a coherent category. We just didn't. We'd, we'd uh, decide to push comedy. I remember the AFC had a comedy fund once, and out of it, I've got to say, with John Clark's help, we revived the Australian comedy industry. But dozen comedy f series came on television within a year of that initiative. We never did it for animation, and I apologise to animators living and dead. <laughs> Screen Australia's never had an animation project manager, and um, when um, we, we had a big campaign in the 1990s to change policy around animation, and um, I was vice president of the Screen Directors Association, and people like Dennis Tupperkoff as well were really, really strong in this, in, campaigning as well. And we managed to change 10BA tax, um, the legislation without going to parliament, which was actually quite a big thing to do because GST was coming in at the time, so that animation could actually be funded differently. And that's actually how Adam managed to get um, his funding for Harvey Crumpet. But um, we have fought and fought and fought to try to have Screen Australia have an animation project manager. I've never, ever... Um, I'll be crucified for this, but I don't care. Um, I've never, ever dealt with anybody at any of the funding bodies that knew anything about animation. It's always an education process. It's, it's been really, really difficult, and I've actually got to the stage where I just go, you just do it without them. I've been very fortunate, and, and I shouldn't bite the hand that feeds me, because I was very fortunate where I did come through in a period of time where there were amazing people at funding bodies. So I'm not saying that there wasn't anybody good at funding bodies. There were some amazing people that were not micromanagers that were actually very supportive, but there was never anybody that knew anything about animation. I'd, I'd like to pick up on one point that Philip made about the perception that people have of animation and it's, and, and in turn use that perhaps to offer my answer to your question about that awkward space um, that independent animators in particular sit in. The perception of animation that people, the vast majority of people have is, is completely wrong. If I sat here and said, I'll take you to the opera or I'll take you to the orchestra or I'll take you to a poetry reading or something, whether or not you wanted to do that, you would have a roughly coherent idea of what I was suggesting to you. If somebody suggested I'll take you to an animation screening of the type, say, that happened at the animation festival, 
vast majority of people would barely recognise in many ways what they're, they're seeing. So the, most people expect that animated film, things that they will see in some sort of cinema setting, be it an actual cinema or on uh, YouTube or something like that, will be um, either funny, as you say, or aimed at a, a kids or a, a family audience. In fact, almost none of the independent animation is made that way because independent animators as artists aren't really gearing themselves to kind of tell those sorts of stories. Um, I struggle, struggle to put together a kids program for the animation festival. Out of three and a half thousand entries, I was lucky. I think I triaged about 150 of them into the kids' pocket and we struggled to get 15 films to make a whole program. My favourite animated film last year was a film called The Pride of Strathmore and it's an awesomely drawn, all hand drawn on paper by the way, um, film about a religious crank in 1920s Southern America who goes after a particular black boxer because in those days black boxers were allowed to climb into the ring with white boxers. It was the one time that a black man in theory was able to lay his hands on a white man and get away with it. Sometimes they got away with it, sometimes they wound up not so much getting away with it, and and the film explored that in full detail, full detail. It was it's a film that if it had been um, formally classified would have gone close to being um, um, restricted 18, and that's actually reasonably. T that's a really great example, but it's fairly typical of what the, of the sorts of issues that animators as artists are pursuing. The other thing is that a lot of them, a good 15, 20 percent of the entries are fully abstract. Animators, independent animators, not interested. You know, a lot of them not interested in telling stories at all. They got no interest in narratives. Not the point. They're not pursuing that. They have a love of making images move and filling a frame with certain kinds of colour and shape and the interaction between all of those. And your average audience just would look at that and not know where to start. I think appreciating it, but that's a very significant part of the independent. So it's about trying to educate audiences ultimately. I think, and that's not for the faint-hearted. I can tell you. All right, um, I think we will go ahead and wrap up now, but let's thank our three panelists, Deb Shapiro, Philip Adams, and Malcolm Turner. And thank you all very much for coming out this evening.